Hey guys, welcome to Boxing Squared for boxing news and views from around the internet. So this is the second edition of Best of the Week, and this one might have a little bit of moss on it. As I mentioned, I had COVID, couldn't cover a number of things, but there were some stories I wanted to pick up on and cover. And the first one being Oscar Rivas having to pull out of the FA Jugba fight. He's now been replaced by Stefan Shaw in the main event for January the 14th at Turning Stone Casino, Verona, New York. But it's such a shame for Rivas. So his promoter had uh, announced... We've just been informed at Top Rank Boxing that Oscar Rivas unfortunately has to withdraw from his fight on January 14 against FIA Jugba in Verona. He injured his eye during the last sparring and his doctor forbids him from entering the ring under these conditions. Yvonne Michel, that is Oscar Rivas' promoter. And it is really disappointing because Oscar Rivas is one of these guys who for years was coming up in the division, just couldn't seem to quite break through and then he had that fight against Bryant Jennings which was his breakthrough moment stops Jennings in the 12th run this is about four years ago now or so yeah it was uh, 2019 and after that he got an opportunity versus Dillian White he puts up a credible performance but ultimately wasn't able to win that fight Dillian White getting a decision although Rivas dropped him in what was it round nine of that fight and as we know there were some murky circumstances with Dillian White in a positive Positive test and the B sample never to be seen. Uh, there also was an issue with the gloves, which um, Revis's team was really kicking up a fuss about. And ultimately, on the back of some of that controversy, he had a high rating in the WBC. And at one point, they let him become the first person uh, to contest for the WBC Bridgeweight title, a new division, which frankly, no one cares about. And even then, since then, Revis has been really inactive. Since the Dillian White fight has barely fought, has been inactive, has been injured, doing nothing at Bridger Weight effectively, really it's been such a shame that he just has kind of been spinning his wheels, really going nowhere. That fight against FA Jugba was a chance to re-announce himself to the heavyweight division that he was still a guy not to be trifled with, that he was still a contender. And I think for many people, because Revis has been so inactive and just really hasn't been top of mind, it's sort of been slipping back in people's depth chart over time. I know there had been, say, like The Ring Magazine and some others had Revis for quite a long time towards the back of the top 10. I always thought that was too high because Revis, what had he really proven? He'd had a good performance at a loss against Dillian White and beat a aging Bryant Jennings. And that was really the sort of sum total. So, you know, they, he was high in a lot of people's rankings for some time. And even still, he is obviously, with this whole Bridgerweight shenanigans, uh, considered to be the best Bridgerweight in the world. But he was coming back to uh, to heavyweight. Uh, there were some issues with uh, his two Bridgerweight mandatories. One had to wait, injure, whatever it was. I don't really care. But... Um, it, him being a heavyweight was another good name, another good contender, and he could have proved his sort of contender creden uh, credentials against FAR Jugba. Just wasn't to be. He's got to be one of the sort of unluckiest sort of heavyweights uh, at the moment and just can't really break through. I mean, I, I know that there's some others you can think of that are sort of on the outside looking in. They're sort of knocking on the door but not getting the opportunities. Martin Bacoli being key among them. You can argue Michael Hunt has kind of been in the wind recently. Otto Varlin looking on the outside looking in. You know, names like that. So, yeah, a real shame for Oscar Rivas. So moving on, Joseph Parker, who was knocked out by Joe Joyce a, a few months ago, set to return to the ring on the 21st of January. He will be facing Jack Massey. And in terms of his preparations, which he came back to the UK, uh, he had responded to some questions. Why didn't you train in New Zealand where it was summertime? It is right now. It's hot, warm, all that sort of stuff. And he says a lot of people are saying, why are you coming back to Morecambe when it's nice and sunny in New Zealand? Nice summer. You've got your family there. You've made some money. You've achieved some things. 
I'm just going to stay and focus. That's why I left my family so I could put in the work. I was at home training, but my wife said, you need to get a fight. I was training with no purpose. And she said, get back over to England and train and fight. That's why I'm here. Thanks to my wife, me and Andy Lee trained this week, but he has gone back to spend Christmas with his young family. It's just me and this Christmas tree. Everyone here in Morecambe has been very accommodating. I've been invited to so many people, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, the upshot from that, he's been training in the UK, away from his family and looking to be dedicated and focused ahead of what is a tune-up fight against Jack Massey. Jack Massey, a cruiserweight who has been talking all sorts of uh, big talk about he's not here just for the payday. He's not here to make up the numbers. He's going to go out there with ambition and try beat Joseph Parker, blah, blah, blah. No offense to Jack Massey, but um, you are the hand-picked, cherry-picked opponent for a comeback fight. That sort of says what the promoter thinks about um, you and your chances. I mean, it's not a credible matchup in terms of it's not a 50-50. Joseph Parker should dog walk this. But at the same in the same breath, Joseph Parker has to go in there, look good, put in a performance. Let's face it, he's coming off a knockout performance against Joe Joyce where he threw the kitchen sink at Joyce, but it was the total wrong strategy. And I have questions about what him and Andy Lee are doing. As I said, ahead of that fight with Joyce, Joseph Parker, and I've been saying this, Parker's basically his whole career since he stepped up to world level. He's not a puncher. You know, having success against a washed Derek Chisora, who Tyson Fury later played with and toyed with, I should say, <laughs> um, having success against him and battering him around the ring wasn't an indication that Parker and Lee had somehow found magic in a bottle and that Parker was some world level puncher. He is not. Joseph Parker has got good skills, good fundamentals, but one of his main problems, and I said this ahead of the Joyce fights, and I've said this ahead of all his major fights in recent years, he fights in spurts. He doesn't have the gas tank to make an opponent work three minutes of every round. So Joyce's relenting style was always going to be an issue for him and probably going to catch up with him, and it did. But the thing is, this opponent, it's not Joe Joyce. It's a cruiserweight who's being brought up to give Joseph Parker a confidence builder. But I do have reservations about this whole continual Joseph Parker's now punching harder. He's this big puncher. We have not seen Joseph Parker knock anyone out at the world level. That's just a fact. No world level fighters have been knocked out or stopped by Joseph Parker. Uh, can we just kind of stop with this madness of trying to make him a puncher? Because what happens is when he exerts all his um, energy and effort in trying to knock someone out, as he did against Joe Joyce, his gas tank just completely depletes. And ultimately, he had nothing left for Joyce in those later rounds, and Joyce just uh, ran him over and ultimately stopped him. So, yeah, for me, the question around Joseph Parker and the Lee link up is, I think, sure, he might be able to punch a little bit harder, but let's not pretend that he's some sort of world-level elite puncher. He's not. But probably in this one, because it's a cruiserweight, he probably is going to uh, get a win here and probably, or possibly a stoppage. It's going to look a little bit bad if he doesn't stop him. I mean, by rights of him being a heavyweight who's got okay pop and really good skills and good fundamentals, he should get the win here and comfortably, and ultimately a stoppage would give him a little bit of buzz and confidence. So January the 21st, the return of Joseph Parker. What do you make of it all? Moving on, bad news for Daniel Dubois on the injury front, expected to be out for several months. So his trainer's father, Barry McGuigan, obviously a very noted and famous former boxer himself, he's given an update saying that, well, it's interesting, Dan has a tear on his ACL, and as soon as we got the news that he had a tear on his ACL, suddenly he was offered the fight with Usyk, which he can't have. He can't box for six months now anyway because of the repair time. Barry McGuigan. So bad news for Daniel Dubois, and the reason he was offered the fight with Usyk is he is the interim champion, or should I say the secondary champion in the WBA, and the WBA wanted to consolidate down to one title, as has been its stated goal in recent years, except it's taken its time with doing that. It has got rid of the interim title, which uh, Dubois once held, and then he fought Trevor Bryan for the secondary title, the so-called WBA heavyweight champion. But we know the real champion is Alexander Usyk. 
So not very good news for him. And let's face it, he probably would have been out for at least three or four months anyway, because modern day heavyweights just don't fight that often anymore. And if Usyk was going to be the next man, it was going to be a little bit tricky because obviously Usyk and Tyson Fury, Fury in the same stable as Daniel Dubois, there was a, a what's going to happen, who's going to fight. You know, the WBA has ordered this. And then you have another mandatory sort of in the background as well with the IBF having been ordered a couple of months ago. But that going quiet on that situation. But Dubois, he didn't look right in there after he got hit on the top of the head and was down. Something looked wrong with either his knee or his ankle. And obviously it's turned out to be his ACL with a tear. So best of recovery for Daniel Dubois. And I guess once he comes back, they're probably not going to throw him in pretty tough straight away. And let's face it, Daniel Dubois, mid-20s, still in a bit of a pseudo-rebuild after that loss to Joe Joyce. Their matchmaking has been of a certain level, and they've kept it uh, at a manageable level for Daniel Dubois and his development. And a few scares against Kevin Lorena, I think they're probably going to serve him up a pudding first up once he gets back. What do you expect? And we'll just round out this video with a quick comment uh, regarding some statements Bob Arum had made about an undisputed fight. So he said, look, they will not be fighting anyone else next. It will be each other next. And that is a good sign, but it's the undisputed fight. We've been talking about it for five years now. I'm quietly confident and optimistic with some of the players involved that the politics won't be as much, but it's boxing. We just have to keep things tempered. What do you make of it all? Drop a comment loud and often. Hit like, hit subscribe. Follow me on Twitter. Boxing underscore squared. I'm out.